Right now, can you give us any um, up-to-date information about what's happening around that dam? Uh, it's obviously a catastrophic uh, breach, yeah. and it's affected huge numbers of people and lives, and there's just so much environmental and humanitarian disaster there. What do you know about the state of that dam right now? Well, obviously, there, there was a significant breach that caused all that flooding. We still don't have uh, specific information uh, about how that breach occurred, and we're doing the best we can talking to Ukrainian authorities to try to assess that. Uh, but really, honestly, much of our focus right now, I mean, the predominant amount of our focus is on helping uh, alleviate some of the humanitarian concerns that you just mentioned. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians in southern, the southern part of the country, all the way down to Kherson, are having to evacuate their homes and leave their businesses behind. Uh, there have been casualties, lives have been lost. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a lack of water, there's a lack of power. Uh, so we're doing everything we can, working through USAID and our humanitarian partners on the ground to get aid and assistance to, to where it's needed. In fact, Christian, within hours of the breach, uh, USAID had worked with their partners on the ground to get buses available to just get people out of the flood waters and get them out of danger. Uh, we have provided uh, boats, uh, water purification equipment, obviously water itself, uh, and other rescue gear. Uh, and so we're going to stay in touch with the Ukrainians about what they need going forward. They, they can count on the United States to continue to support. You mentioned water, and we understand that uh, only, you know, sort of shipped in water, so to speak, uh, can be used right. for drinking. They, they're entirely reliant on outside water coming in. President Zelensky has also said publicly um, that Russia is, in fact, firing on people who are trying to evacuate and on any assistance uh, measures. This is what he said. The situation is extremely difficult. Russian troops do not stop artillery strikes at the very territory where people are being evacuated. Unfortunately, there are wounded from their terrorist attacks. People who are rescuing and evacuating from the Russian ecocide are also forced to flee from Russian fire. Um, John Kirby, there is a lot of anger inside Ukraine about the notion that they may be considered, you know, responsible for it, on the one hand, on the other hand. Everybody knows that Russia has been bombarding this area for a long time, and the threat to this dam has been public concern for a long, long time. Do you really think that it's anything other than Russia? Well, we don't really know. We just don't know what caused the breach of the dam. And again, we're trying to assess that as best we can. We're not on the ground, but we're trying to do the best we can to assess it. I think it's fair to say uh, that we all need to recognize Russia was illegally in that part of Ukraine. They have no business being on Ukrainian territory, period. But we know that they were occupying uh, areas in that part of southern Ukraine. We know that they were occupying the dam and the reservoir. Exactly. And so clearly they have, clearly they had uh, uh, given themselves illegally, but given themselves the mantle of responsibility for that dam and for the safety of that dam. So clearly in that context, yeah, Russia cer certainly bears r responsibility here uh, in general for being, just being there physically. But what caused the breach exactly, that's what we just don't know. And again, uh, while we still want to figure that out, we are mainly focused on trying to alleviate the humanitarian disaster th that that breach has caused. But it's clearly, you know, many believe that, and certainly the Ukrainians, that it, and I've heard American officials say, that it could be a very cynical plot to, or method, of trying to thwart the counteroffensive that we understand is finally underway. It would thwart the counteroffensive, wouldn't it? I mean, how does a how does a nation fight with all the mod cons that you've sent? We understand the Bradleys, uh, other armored vehicles that you've all sent are in are in use right now. It's very difficult for them to come across that kind of flooded terrain. Well, with the caveat that I won't speak for the Ukrainian military or what their plans or intentions are in terms of offensive operations, uh, that's really for them to speak to. Certainly, if you just look at the flooding that it was caused south uh, and to the southwest of the dam, 
through that southern part of Ukraine down to Kherson. Uh, clearly, uh, that kind of flooding is going to have an impact on a military's uh, uh, ability to maneuver uh, and, and to fight. I mean, just the flooding itself will, will make conditions uh, un, uh, un, 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 uh, untenable for that kind of fighting. But also, it's going to uh, necessarily, as it has, uh, diverted Ukrainian resources uh, and energy uh, and even some of their, uh, you know, their military's attention to trying to help alleviate the humanitarian catastrophe. So in that regard, certainly there's going to be uh, an impact to Ukraine and through their resourcing and their and their and their ability, uh, but again, there is a lot of fighting going on uh, elsewhere in, in the eastern part of the country, and, and we'll let Mr. Zelensky speak to, to to that and to characterize it. So even you know, I know you will let him, but but, but we've heard and we've read and we know that you have obviously many uh, intelligence and eyes on the ground. The Russian president has said that the counteroffensive has started. Uh, and that it's not going well for Ukraine. And we've heard separately from U.S. officials that there's been a lot of uh, fight back by the Russians and, and quite a lot of casualties in terms of materiel and men. What can you tell us about the initial stages of, of this counteroffensive? Well, again, I'll let the Ukrainians speak to their uh, their offensive operations. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't characterize it, and we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't get ahead of President Zelensky. But clearly, uh, uh, and you have CNN reporters on the ground witnessing them th this for themselves. There is uh, there is a stepped up fighting uh, along that eastern uh, flank there, uh, along the eastern eastern side of the country, uh, all the way from uh, Donbas and including around Bakhmut and and points further south. Um, and so there is there is contact between these two military forces. There is fighting there have been casualties uh, and what we're going to be focused on again without characterizing what they're doing or speaking for them but what we're going to stay focused on is making sure uh, that they have all the resources uh, the, the capabilities the training the tools that they need to be successful in the weeks and months ahead and that includes Christian uh, in coming days I think you'll see uh, some more announcements from the United States about additional uh, aid and security and weapons and capabilities that will be go going to the Ukrainian armed forces to help them uh, another ominous uh pledge from President Putin was that in the matter of days, he is going to deploy tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus. He says that they've built the whatever they need to build uh, to house these things. What can the United States do about that? Have you demarched Belarus? Well, what is the what is the actual real threat of them being in Belarus? This is a, another example uh, of just reckless and irresponsible rhetoric and, and, and posturing about nuclear capabilities from Mr. Putin uh, and from Moscow. Uh, the, the, a nuclear war can, can, should never be fought, can never be won. Uh, we've been very clear about that. Uh, this is dangerous rhetoric, which we have to take seriously. We can't just cast it off uh, as, as, as bluster. We have to take it seriously coming from uh, a country like Russia and from Mr. Putin. So we're doing the best we can to monitor. Uh, we don't see anything out there that, that shows us that there's a, an imminent indication of movement of nuclear capabilities or an imminent risk of, uh, of nuclear uh, uh, war inside Ukraine or even uh, on the continent. And, and I can tell you that we've uh, we've seen nothing that would cause us to change our own uh, deterrent posture when it comes to those kinds of capabilities, and we're watching this uh, very, very closely. 